Welcome back from break. So it was kind of a mistake of the organizers to give me a couple of minutes before I start my session because I want to talk about me. <laughs> uh, mainly I want to say what a groupie I've been of the regional monitoring program over the years. So I was in the, in the shadows in 1992 when, when um, the Aquatic Habitat Institute reconstituted itself the San Francisco Estuary Institute and we created the regional monitoring program. And then and I talked my consulting firm into letting me come to annual meetings way before I was hired by the water board. So in 2000, when I was hired by the water board, I was uh, hired in to work on um, Department of Defense cleanup of our military bases that fringe the bay. And also um, looking at uh, sort of Dykes Bay land sites that were going to be transformed into wetlands. And uh, one in particular was Hamilton Army Airfield. And I relied a lot on coming to the scientists at the regional monitoring program in particular and others, talking about PCBs, talking about other particular um, contaminants of concern, DDT. And I got into an argument with uh, my fellow sister agencies about DDT at Hamilton, and I could say, I've got regional monitoring data from San Pablo Bay. And if you establish a cleanup level that low, I think we were talking about one or two parts per billion or something for DDT, you're going to have contamination coming in on the tide so uh, from San Pablo Bay itself. So let's do something a little more reasonable. So I'm really happy to have had all the data that we've had over the years for a lot of those projects um, through the RMP. And uh, when, then I promoted with, um, within the water board to working in the planning division, I was like, oh, I really hit the jackpot. Because now I get to spend even more time thinking about working with the RMP, work groups, coming to the whole review committee, um, and helping to shape a little bit about the data that we collect and inform decisions for the water board. And in answer to Steve's question earlier, I really think that this organization and its collaborative approach provides a lot of information and a lot of information that informs management decisions. So we've been really lucky and I've been personally really lucky to be affiliated with everybody here. And um, I'm a groupie. Is everybody else here a groupie of the, of the regional monitoring program? Let's give a hand to the regional monitoring program. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, <clears throat> There's two talks today that are, and I think Tom talk, told me he was going to talk about hardly strictly, you did, right? Hardly strictly uh, RMP. Yep. So this is one of those sessions that's hardly strictly. And the first uh, talk is from Kevin Lundy. Kevin works in the planning division with me. He is uh, our TMDL program manager now, and he also heads up our surface water ambient monitoring program as a program lead. Uh, when uh, about a year ago, everybody remember the fires, and uh, we were all in a panic. And uh, I stepped up and decided I would coordinate some of our fire response. Um, and one of, those, one of those pieces, the elements, was should we be monitoring? Everybody was questioning, you know, we've got these fires. There were a lot of these properties were in close proximity to a lot of our creeks and our waterways. We have special status species. So I'm on, is, our, is this going to be a problem when the rains start? And um, Kevin stepped up and uh, did a really great job of pulling together available information and working with our staff who went out. You're going to hear more from him about uh, what the staff had to do in order to collect this data that we're going to be presenting to you. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to introduce each speaker as we as we as we move through the session. Um, but one of the questions I want you to keep thinking about is what do these three talks have in common? So I'm going to we're going to ask that question at the end. So I'm going to welcome Kevin Lundy. Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> So thanks for the opportunity to share with you the results of our North Bay, excuse me, I'll just do this, stay away from that one, North Bay Fire Water Quality Monitoring Program. Um, so we, um, we started this work, as Naomi mentioned, because the fires were uh, raging at this time of October 11th of last year. And uh, we wanted to know, well, what, what could we be doing? What kind of contaminants might we be expecting to enter in these watersheds? And so, um, so we set apart to answer that question. I'll, I'll also take a second to, to thank SFEI for not letting me work on a talk late last night and asking for it early. I got the phone, and my daughter's, my four-year-old daughter's bike had arrived. So thankfully, they make them very easy to build, and we could build it in 10 minutes and you know, get her riding out on the street. So I was a little uh, fun parenting last night instead of um, fiddling with details. Of Advancing. 
Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's dark on the screen too. Um, so we'll start with. Um, there were three main fires um, last year: the Atlas, the Nuns, and Tubbs fires um, that were widespread across Napa River uh, watershed as well as Sonoma Creek watershed, and those also entered into some other neighbor watersheds. <coughs> As you can see on this on this figure, there were three different fires. They were all going on. Um, they burned over 1,300 structures, including cars, sheds, as well as houses. And some of our particular areas of concern we're focusing in, as you can see in this map, in Kenwood and Glen Ellen, where homes were burned that were immediately adjacent to the creek. And so there was the greatest potential for pollutant uh, ash and burn debris to enter the creeks from those areas. So what are the water quality impacts from fires that we might expect? Well, there's a lot of literature out there um, uh, discussing some of these. One is increased sediment um, and pollutants bound to those sediments. And in particular, um, that it involves a lot of the different heavy metals, such as lead, cadmium, zinc, and copper that can um, essentially stored in plant matter, but when it's burned, a lot of the other materials released, and you're left with these trace metals that then accumulate in the watershed and are washed down to uh, the rivers and the storms. Um, also, what can happen is there's a lot of fire retardants placed on the landscape to prevent uh, the fire from burning, but also to help revegetation after the, the fire is done. So there's uh, a lot of phosphorus in these fire retardants, well, some ammonia, and so we were looking at nutrients because they might cause eutrophic conditions in these watersheds. So that was another analyte of interest. Um, and additionally, uh, we also looked at um, PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, because they're released when materials are burned. Uh, the uh, incomplete combustion of materials release those into the atmosphere, and so we wanted to know if those were present. They can cause aquatic toxicity to organisms as well as cancer and kidney. So because of these known environmental effects from wildfires, our office was concerned about these important resources. There's a very um, sensitive steelhead and Chinook fishery population in both Napa River and Creek watersheds. Uh, we invested a lot of effort into restoration, especially in Napa River, to improve habitat and provide better uh, habitat for these fisheries. We didn't want to see those, any of those efforts go to waste because of what's happening with fires and other impacts on these species. Uh, we also have produced a number of TMBLs in these watersheds to improve water quality, and we didn't want to see, if we could, the implementation of these programs affected by the fires. And lastly, we were interested in knowing if there were these releases of uh, new pollutants from the fires, such as metals, that could be commingling with existing uh, runoff from normal storm water, but that would cause uh, a new problem that we hadn't yet observed in the watershed, potentially contributing to a new impairment or taking those pollutants farther down into the bed. Uh, we were also interested in drinking water, potential drinking water impact. There are three drinking water reservoirs in Napa Valley that were of concern, so we worked with the Division of Drinking Water to um, understand those and wanted to monitor what was coming off of these. So just, um, just after the fire, um, the water board staff um, went out with CAL FIRE and the other crews there um, to help offer um, advice on the implementation of stormwater BMPs that was designed to essentially manage the runoff of burn debris, ash, and other material and prevent that from entering into the creek. So as you can see, these are a uh, common approach here of using a lot of wattles and supported with gravel bags here, so those would stay in place on the downhill edge of um, around a burnt structure. And sometimes the goal of the, the stormwater management was also just to prevent clean water on, on the up end and uh, part of a burn home from entering into the burned area as well. So that's where we uh, work with the uh, Sonoma Ecology Center as well 
um, and help fund them to work directly with landowners and provide additional stormwater BMPs, areas where CAL FIRE didn't get to when it first implemented some of these um, stormwater control measures. And the main objective of our uh, program for monitoring was to determine if these BMPs were working and were effective. So to develop our monitoring program, we coordinated closely with uh, the North Coast Board. They were actively engaged in a lot of fire response. In fact, their office was closed for a week um, because of the fires. And, but they were um, figuring out what to do with their fire response, so we were in the same boat. Had a lot of communication with them about um, what their monitoring program would involve. And we were also thankful that WERP, Southern California Coastal Water Resources Project, developed a, a great uh, paper on potential uh, analytes to measure response to wildfires. So we had some great resources at hand, which was fabulous since we only had about a week to plan an entire study across two watersheds and, and figure out how to do this uh, before the first rain came. So we sampled uh, 10 sites in total, um, five in each watershed, and we had four uh, <coughs> burned reference sites. So this example here in Sonoma here, we have a site in Kenwood, a little farther down in Yalupa Creek. Um, we have two sites near Glen Ellen, as I mentioned, for our urban areas, um, the watershed that were hit hard. Um, and then we have a reference site here, Grand Creek, in an unburned part of the watershed. Um, and we needed to sample a reference site because we didn't have a lot of stormwater data for these parameters. And so we wanted to be able to try to tease apart the effect of just normal stormwater conditions um, from fire effects. And also in that vein, we sampled at baseline, at least in the creeks that were flowing, because as you know, not all these creeks are flowing at the end of the summer, but where they were flowing, we sampled pre-storm conditions to also get that effect of what were the conditions like for um, there was a lot of runoff coming across the So based on the um, analytes I mentioned earlier, we included the normal you know, host of characters here for total and dissolved metals, pHs, nutrients. Uh, we were also interested in some of the sediment-based um, parameters like CSS and turbidity, and also looking at our YSI readings for dissolved oxygen and pH. Those can vary in response to the fire. And the nice thing about all these analytes is it makes a fun collection of bottles, as you can see on the right. So, you know, it's important to keep all these labels straight and, uh, and make sure you send all the right bottles to the right lab. So we uh, were able to sample four storm events um, with the sampling program. And as you can see in this photo, um, it rains uh, all happen to have, you know, rains at night. Normally people are sleeping, but our crew is out sampling. And so um, the first storm we were out, we wanted to be ready for a first flush event. So I'm going to walk you through um, hydrographs here on the bottom. So in the blue line, we see the, the flow response in the creek here. And it's just a little blip in response to this one inch rain event. Um, we were very concerned that light ash and material might be entering the creek. So we really wanted to get out there um, on the low end of the spectrum, see what we observe. Another storm hit later. In November, a um, little bit larger, got a little more of a blip. Um, and then the third storm, January, um, is a close to a two inch rain event. We finally got a nice um, flow response. And I'll point out that our, our black dots here, which are our sample locations, are on the rising limb of the hydrograph. That was our goal to sample at that time when the majority of pollutants might be entering this watershed present. And our fourth storm, which was um, sampled at the end of March, kind of never know when the rainy season is done. And uh, happened that we actually got a lot of rain in March, and the crew was ready to sample. And so here, uh, flows were up to 10,000 cubic feet per second. So notice the scale change on the right figure is that they were five times higher than any of the other previous storms. So then we compared our, our list of analytes here to um, our basin plan water quality objectives, um, if they were uh, applicable, where well, we used a lot of the EPA aquatic life recommended criteria um, as well for analyzing these nearly 2,000 data points. 
Of that, only one example had an exceedance of any acute threshold. That was for aluminum, and it was in our reference. So it wasn't related to fire, <laughs> but those are the things you learn when you sample reference sites you never sampled before, is there's some heat geology in them. Um, for the chronic threshold exceedances, um, a number of those were actually for uh, selenium and mercury, um, also in reference sites and in our burn sites, so likely another uh, uh, factor not related to this fire, but either related to local geology. Um, but we did see a few hits for copper and lead, which are, are we were expecting to see some of those, but really only about five. So not many exceedances for those parameters um, compared to the data that we were looking at in Southern California. And um, we also then looked at the increase for some things like nutrients, where we may not have kind of black and white thresholds for how to evaluate them. So we did see an increase in concentrations during storm conditions, but we saw those same factors occur in reference sites. So we concluded that it was more a cause of just general stormwater flow and not because of fires that we saw those um, small increases in nutrients. And I'll point out that we were, it, it took a while when we get the data back, but is everything right? I was really expecting higher numbers. And so, you know, we compare these to the results from Southern California, where they had uh, 10 times lower the amount of uh, copper there, 100 times, we had 100 times less in zinc. So just really different numbers than have been observed in Southern California work. So our conclusions were that um, there was, uh, we were happy to find there was no immediate threat to water quality in either Napa River or Sonoma Creek relative to the compounds that we were studying um, with this target analysis. And I'll get to um, the non-target analysis part a little bit later. Um, and that our, we believe that the stormwater BMPs um, were very effective in preventing debris from entering the creek. So we looked at them multiple times um, during the wet season. They were trapping ash and debris as expected. So we were, we were concluding that the, you know, that combination of <coughs> our BMPs um, were effective in reducing the expected magnitude of the problem that we thought we would see. But I will add a caveat that we were lucky to have a very mild winter. So there was just a little bit of rain in November, a little bit of a dry spell, a warm condition. So um, people were amazed then in the field to see how fast the grasses were growing back. And so it, we were, had the lucky opportunity that nature provided a bit more of a, a natural buffer um, where we didn't add our own stormwater BMP. And so their grasses were growing back. And that is likely a factor that helped in us not seeing the extreme water quality problems. So <clears throat> for future monitoring, um, we, uh, we're going to go back again and sample one storm in this next year because the literature shows that you can have uh, effects from fires lasting for multiple years. So just because we were, thought we were out of the clear for <coughs> one year doesn't mean um, there isn't something to look at this next year. So we'll look at a hopefully target a very large storm. Nature cooperates uh, two to four inches in 24 hours and uh, get out there and sample that. We'll coordinate with our North Coast Water Board and keep a similar analyte list unless we kind of hear back from either some of our partners or the non-target analysis that there's other parameters we can look at. So I wanted to give you a, a quick highlight on what the North Coast Water Board did um, because our results were very similar to theirs also help me feel comfortable with what we were seeing. So they used the same analyte list, except they also sampled for water toxicity. And um, because of that, very expensive analyte, and they only sampled at four locations relative to their fire area. They sampled pre-storm and during storms, just like us, and also just like us. They did not see exceedances, metals, PAHs, or nutrients in their analysis. And they thankfully also did not see any uh, water toxicity, any of the three species that they measured. This is a, a good result for us because we did not fork over the big bucks for water toxicity. And, and then I felt that we maybe played the bet right, that if there were ever going to be problems, they would have found it in you know, Santa Rosa downtown, where a coffee park burned, and all kinds of 
I mean, I guess I could have gone into the storm drain, but they didn't see problems with those areas. Um, so outreach is important for us with this event. Um, people were wanting to know what's water quality, are things safe, is there a problem? Um, so uh, we have a uh, website that summarizes this, this information. Um, the main tool that we use to share with the public, our partners in the county, were fact sheets. So we emailed these around to our listservs, and hopefully some of you in the audience ended up seeing them. Um, and um, also on our website, we've you know, got our sampling uh, analyte list here and our sample <coughs> study design, the raw data. And I want to briefly tell you about this interactive mapping feature on the bottom. I could for just a moment tell you that there's a, 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 a program called Tableau that I'll just point that out. Thanks. Um, and the neat thing about Tableau is it's a free program. And I think it's a really interesting way for us to think about sharing information. So you can put in your text. Now I, I love it. now I can't see it. Now I'm going to point to this. So you can see there's text over here. You can create these features where you can um, just click on like one site, for example. You click on the site that highlights down here, and you can scroll through this information and then see in red there's exceedances um, where we saw some exceedances. So it was just a really neat tool to share information. And so I wanted to put in a plug for this type of information sharing because this is a data rich community. And it's a chance to think about how to, we said, how to turn that data into information. Okay, moving on to the next slide. All right, so I'll briefly share a little bit about the um, uh, work that SFEI is doing and we're collaborating with partners um, at San Diego State University and Department of Toxins uh, Substance Control. Um, they're working on the non-target analysis. So our efforts were focused in this kind of window here in this figure that you saw before from Phil. And they are going to tell us what we might have missed. Are there other parameters that we should have been looking for that were present in these watersheds that we didn't know to look? And so far, the results are preliminary, but um, they were able to find that the um, burn sites have more compounds than the non-burn sites and that there is a higher intensity uh, signal from those burn sites compared to reference sites. And it looks like there's um, analytes that are being produced are these, which I'm not a chemist, but I, there are a lot of chemists here. So enjoy these figures. <laughs> very exciting. There's circles and there's O's, there's oxygen. So that's really important. And, and, and June Sue is in the audience. And if you want to ask him about those, he, he can answer those questions for you. Um, but also, they're finding some non-traditional CAHs. Um, since we only ran uh, the priority list of 16, it's a chance to see if there are other pHs produced at levels that we should be concerned. And SFEI is looking for additional help in finding funds to analyze uh, the second round of samples um, collected in the study. So I want to um, thank the swamp sampling crew. The storms happened at, uh, they essentially leave our office at about 6 or 7 p.m., drive up in the rain to Napa and Sonoma, uh, start sampling at 9, uh, sample till about 3 a.m., and then drive on back home. So I want to thank them for their hard work and for uh, really creating a valuable data set that I can share with you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Kevin. So our next speaker, Ting Wu, has been with the uh, Estuary Institute since 2013. He's an environmental science and hydrologist with a uh, PhD in environmental engineering. I'm really looking forward to this talk. I know you're, you're looking at how modeling can help us inform where we should be looking in the watershed about PCBs and PCB loading, and uh, make some decisions about how to, how to minimize those loads. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will talk about uh, a, a green plan eight, uh, a planning tool we have developed 
to support a green structure planning for stormwater management. This is a five-year project with a major investment from State Water Board and EPA Region 9, and also has a strong support and collaboration with our regional and the local partners. So Green Structure has emerged as a multi benefit solution to address stormwater both quantity and quantity concerns. And currently in the Bay Area, um, municipalities are required to develop and also implement Green Structure Master Plan uh, by the stormwater regional permits to meet uh, PCB and PM, uh, PCB and the mercury load reduction. Uh, in developing this plan, however, there are a number of uh, key questions need to be addressed. Um, to begin with, you need to know where in the urban landscape um, are possible locations for retrofit, and uh, where are the effective locations where green structure can reduce the most pollutant and the stormwater runoff. And then how much benefit we can get from this big investment and uh, among potential tens of thousands uh, combinations of GR types and the locations and the numbers, and what are the most cost-effective ones to meet your uh, management goals. And uh, lastly, as uh, implementation effort begins over time, uh, where has the green structure been implemented in the landscape and how do we track progress? So Group Plan H was developed to address those big questions. So this tool um, uh, has a four uh, distinct tools. Um, it has a GIS site locator tool, a modeling tool, a optimization tool, and also a tracker. So it, it's very quantitative, uh, robust, and flexible. It has this uh, modular structure. So therefore, you can use the individual tools or utilize the whole package together. So the tool has a capacity to address a range of stormwater management needs from uh, supporting your GR planning, uh, stormwater resources plan, uh, alternative compliance, and uh, uh, reasonable truth analysis. Um, it's scientifically vigorous. It developed with um, oversight from a technical uh, advisor committee and also local stakeholder growth. Um, it's uh, open source. So therefore, it is great uh, for the public to use. So the first tool, um, GI site locator tool. So this tool combines uh, physical properties of different GI types with uh, landscape characteristics to identify potential locations. So the tool can utilize a wide range of regional and the local GI layers, such as the soil, your slope, um, storm drain network, your utility life, uh, priority development areas. So it all depends on what your local priorities are and what data you have. Um, so the analysis can be done at large regional scale, such as this what we did for East Bay portal. This covers 13 drill stations along East Bay from uh, North uh, Asuncion Dale down to Unicity in the South. So you can also do very detailed analysis at a watershed or city scale where location can be identified at each uh, city block. So, so therefore, this tool can take you really from not knowing where to put things uh, at the first, at the beginning, and to some very specific and uh, rapid locations. Um, so those locations can serve as a starting point to for your green plan. Uh, green infrastructure planning and to guide your future implementation effort. So the second tool, modeling tool, this tool is built upon EPA's SWIM. Um, so within the toolkit, this tool is used to quantify and establish a baseline loading and stormwater runoff condition. So this baseline condition can help you identify what would be the critical source area in terms of runoff and pollutant load where green structure can be most effective. That's, that's referred to you know, where can be effective locations you can identify through this modeling tool. And more importantly, SWIM has this capacity to quantify water quality and quantity benefit from different GI types 
based on their specific design. So therefore, that make it possible to do a cost benefit analysis in the next tool, um, optimization tool. So for this tool, we uh, use um, a model objective optimization algorithm to help identify what would be the best combinations of PI types and the number of sites and different locations that achieve your water quality goal with a minimal cost. So the tool requires the, both the cost information and also the design spec of each type goes into the tool. It utilizes a modeling tool as an engine, you know, to uh, with that uh, capacity to compare the performance of different combinations. So through a iterative process, this tool compare the both cost and the benefit of tens of thousands of uh, different combinations, and then help you to sort out what will be the most uh, cost effective one. So the output. From this tool, um, it's we call it cost effectiveness curve. So this curve relates the relevant implementation cost to various level of either load or runoff reduction. So each point on this curve represents a portfolio of uh, green structure types and numbers at different locations. Um, so this curve is called um, optimal front. So any points along those front are optimal solutions because everything else below that either will be more costly or less effective. Um, so for instance, if you're interested in the 30% PCB load reduction, so this green dot represents the optimal solution. So any point, there's many other solutions that to the right can achieve the same reduction goal but with higher cost. So the cost difference between this one versus the worst one can be as much as $100 million. And also if you look at vertically, uh, the effectiveness uh, difference between the optimal solution versus the worst one can be as much as 30%. So this really highlights the need and the benefit of using the tool like that to help you systematically sort out what would be the uh, best combination of uh, PI types and numbers to help you put things in a, the right things at the right location to meet your management goals. And also, um, for any given uh, optimal solutions, you can visualize uh, how the green structure are distributed across your study area on the map. So for this green dot here is a number of uh, PI are required at different locations together that can achieve overall 13% reduction for this study area. Noting, you know, more in general, more um, DIs are identified as a highly pollutant area. So this is also a very important message. Give us a confidence. This tool works really, you know, logically produce the results as we expect it to. So lastly, we also develop a tracker. This is a web-based regional GI database that keeps the information of each site, either within the city boundary of a particular watershed and county or region-wide. So the tool can be used to display your any plan or your implemented or petition project uh, in your jurisdiction. And it also utilizes a modeling tool to help estimate what would be the effectiveness of all these implemented projects. Um, so the tool also uh, took a lot of features from uh, municipal uh, annual reports. So therefore, it can really help them streamline that process and ease the burden every year, you know, on the municipal, uh, on the permittee. So over um, the past five years, there have been a number of regional applications um, for this tool to support CR planning uh, in our region. Um, with ABAC and the city of San Mateo, we use only the first two CI site located to help identify potential location to support their transportation planning effort. And with the city of uh, San Jose, Sunnyvale, Auckland, Richmond, and also Contra Costa County, so the full toolkit was used 
the goal was to help them uh, to provide some quantitative analysis to support their yeah, master plan to meet permanent requirements. So here are the typical output uh, from this full toolkit application. So you all have a map showing the, all the potential locations and also the table uh, showing the, all the attributes at each site. And you have a baseline uh, stormwater runoff and the polluting load map help you identify critical areas. Um, and then optimization tool will produce this cost effective curve and also you can Visualize, um, visualize any potential you know, optimal solution of management inches. So those outputs uh, provide foundations for municipalities to take those to develop their green infrastructure master plan to meet permanent requirement as well as guide future implementation efforts. So moving away from green structure, last year we actually did a very interesting study using this toolkit to support wetland restoration planning in uh, Sonoma County. Um, so the goal of this um, project was to demonstrate a watershed approach for wetland planning. So the toolkit was used to prioritize, also identify a wetland restoration project site um, within uh, Santa Rosa Creek watershed um, uh, in order to reduce stormwater runoff and nutrient load to Laguna Santa Rosa. So this map showing, uh, this is the output uh, from the application, those maps showing the number of different types of uh, wetland uh, projects are identified through the tool and then together they can achieve the overall nutrient uh, load reduction goal for this watershed. So also currently we have um, two ongoing applications, both funded by EPA and Region 9. So first one is uh, healthy watershed resilient balance. This is a million dollar uh, four year project. So one of tasks of this large project is to explore ways of integrating water quality benefit with ecologic functions. So the toolkit will be used to identify area of opportunities where uh, green structure can be synergized with urban forestry to achieve uh, multiple benefits. We're going to look at potential water quality benefit from uh, water quality quantity benefit from urban forestry, but on the other hand, we also want to look at if there's potential ecologic function some kind of uh, green structure can provide. So the second application um, is uh, preparing for the storm, uh, again, another million dollar project. So one of tasks is we're working with Zone 7 Water Agency to develop a valley-wide urban greening vision for Livermore Valley. So the focus of this project is actually on flood control and groundwater integration. So the tool will be used to uh, quantify the most uh, primarily water quantity benefit um, from uh, green structure in a watershed and also some restoration effort the valley currently planned. So in summary, so this tool is a very flexible and robust planning tool. It can be applied to a variety of uh, project settings with very different characteristics and it can operate on the multiple spatial scales to address uh, a range of management need and the target pollutants. And you can utilize individual tools, one or two of them, or the entire package. And we are uh, constantly moving the tool to the new direction as the science and the management needs evolve. And the tool um, can be used and uh, currently is being used to address, to address a range of um, stormwater needs from um, supporting GI planning stormwater resources plan, uh, reasonable assurance analysis, also potentially alternative compromise in the future. So in the end, I want to uh, acknowledge um, State Water Board and also EPA and Region 9 for funded uh, the development of this tool and also our uh, municipal partners for working with us very closely over the past five years to develop and further enhance and apply these great tools to address some of their stormwater needs. 
And uh, if you are interested in knowing more about this tool, uh, here's the website on our um, SAPR website and where you can find the tool uh, toolkit itself, the user menus, and also the demonstration report to help you understand how this tool can be used to uh, maybe help some of your management need as well. <coughs> What did you use as the effectiveness data? I'm sorry? What did you use? What was the, the data that you used for um, predicting effectiveness of the green infrastructure project? Yes, a good question. Actually, it's, we don't use the data. Actually, it's simulated uh, dynamically through SWIM. SWIM has this ORD module where you can have all these specs. You know, let's say you design a uh, biotension, you have the depth of soil, the surface area, what is the drainage area into it, the swim can help you just run through the model. The model will calculate it, how much reduction it can be done. So that's the one of key reasons we use this model because it can really relate to the specific design and physics perspective of different GI types to, uh, to the effectiveness. So you don't have to kind of assume or have some literature value which can be stacked. So this is actually a dynamic. It varies storm by storm. So we, we tend to look at kind of on an annual basis. Um, so, so that optimization tool, how big are the uncertainty bands on kind of any one solution? Like is, is you know, how, how significant are, are really kind of those differences? Um, well, I, here's what I think. I think, yes, there is always uncertainty when you do, uh, especially involves modeling. And this uh, um, optimization also involves cost. As we all know, the cost can vary hugely from side to side, design to design. So they are definitely uncertain. However, I think this tool, the purpose is not really, um, to get like absolute value or in terms of effectiveness or the cost, it actually is to compare the narrative of different solutions. So it's like say the two, basically I think the, the most uh, useful aspect is to help you to say this combination is better than others. But whether then, you know, those total cost or effective is exactly the number the two produce, I don't think so. There, there will be a rebound, but I think we have to keep in mind the two is actually help you sort of, you know, like if you have the level play field, which combination is better than others. I think how we want to incorporate the uncertainty. Well, I think it's not a um, telegram. We actually run on an annual basis. We say this is a kind of one, yeah, one year. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think that's a quick question. I think the cost is always kind of uh, drug people, right? So uh, um, to be honest, I sometimes look at the number, I'm just kind of a little bit depressing too. Like, oh my gosh, it's like so big. But keep in mind, this is a planning tool. Uh, it, it all depends on what the cost information you gain, get into. So um, so we're not talking about, you know, the again, we're not want to interpret the results in a kind of absolute amount of dollar you have to spend in order to achieve back to the early point, 
the tool really is trying to help you to compare different combinations. So the cost in reality could be much lower and also thinking about it is actually going to spend over multiple decades. It's not like this year you need to spend $100, um, 100 million. It's all like over 20, 30 years and you can incorporate into transportation, you know, development and other private uh, partnership with, um, you know, so all kinds of ways. So again, we don't want to say this is the absolute value. We want to say here is what based on the cost goes into the tool is trying to help you to compare the different scenario, not really to say, okay, how much you actually well, it's, it's interesting to compare two trades that are the order of the cost of the well-being, but that's interesting. Yeah, more benefit. Yeah, more benefit. Thanks to Phil for uh, the invite today. A very exciting data set, and I'm really honored to be here to share some of the results with you. Um, so I acknowledge my co-authors, David Schulhammer and Paul Works, and um, our, luckily, Phil already said sediment's important, so I'm going to skip all that, but uh, one important thing is that we don't really know a lot about what's happening at the ocean boundary at the, the Golden Gate, and so that's what we're here to figure out today. So I'm going to skip on to, from the over intro to talk about sediment fluxes and budgets. And so um, sediment flux is the, the rate of transport at a cross section. So we have a velocity profile and a concentration profile. We can multiply those together and get transport. And if we know something about the distribution of velocity and concentration in a cross section, we can get a flux value. And this is different from a sediment budget, which is a way to account for sediment gains and losses within a region of interest. And so I'm re representing here a control volume that I care about here. And so I, I wanted to figure out the sediment budget for this. I would identify the inflows, the outflows. And um, there's other processes happening inside, like deposition and erosion. And so you can account for all that and determine the change in storage in your region of interest is the sum of the inflows and the outflows. So managing sediment in the bay, a uh, useful tool for that is sediment budgets. Uh, this is an example from 2005 from Dave Schulhammer of a sediment budget that he developed with his co-authors for San Francisco Bay. Um, so we've got some the outflows and the inflows and the change in storage happening inside. And the main point is that in this particular budget, the outflow term at the Pacific Ocean was estimated from all the other, uh, using conservation of mass, computing it from all the other terms shown in this figure. And so, the objective, one of the main objectives of our study here is to collect the data needed to refine this outflow term flow out the ocean boundary. Uh, and so it's the, the data for that includes sediment flux measurements. And sediment flux usually only happens when there's storms, when there's a storm. Um, so that's just kind of like the, the background of how the study came, came about. And then just to take you back to the kind of the the vision of this project, we're back in 2015. This was the height of the drought. We had extremely warm temperatures, extremely low precipitation values. Um, near the end of 2015, there was uh, all the hype about the El Nino that was coming in 2016. So the year was a really uh, great expectations for that year. And so um, that was when we developed the study. We wanted to be opportunistic about capturing any storms that happened in 2016. And there was one, this is a satellite image from the middle of March of 2016, uh, coastal California, you can see the Sacramento River, nice chocolate milk, that's sediment, 
down, uh, the yellow bypass flood control structure build. So it was a reasonable storm um, that we were able to study. And then we went back in the summer period in June of 2016 to get kind of the low flow condition. And then there was 2017. So uh, this is a, 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 a some data from BWR about uh, pre cumulative precipitation over a water year starting on October 1st and ending on September 30th um, using data from eight stations in the northern Sierra. Uh, and the main point is that uh, this blue uh, image, the blue blob there, that's the average condition for over many decades of data. Uh, and then for 2016, when we were out, you could see this blue line here, which is slightly above average. And then so 2017, which was the wettest year on record. So um, we were very fortunate to have the opportunity to repeat uh, measurements during a proper extreme event. And so just to um, <clears throat> give a little bit of context for the, the two years, uh, this is an, another uh, water year plot, so October 1st, September 30th. And I'm showing delta outflow as computed from BWR's the model. Uh, the outflow from the delta into the bay indicator of water discharge and storm. Um, the, the dash line in here is the, the long-term mean. Um, and then <clears throat> if the two colors, the, the first color, the darker one, is the 2016 data. So you can see that uh, the, the year started out below average and pretty much stayed below average until we had the one storm that happened in, uh, in, in March. And then um, these, these vertical lines indicate when we went out. So this vertical line here is when we went out right after the 2016 storm. And we came back in June of 2016, more measurements. And then uh, the subsequent year in 2017, we were able to go out. And so you can see the water year started out a little below normal, um, got above normal pretty early, and then stayed above normal. We had two big storms. And then the Oroville Dam was on the verge of failure. And uh, we were able to get out and do our measurements right after that second. And just to note that delta outflow is not the only source of sediment for San Francisco Bay, but uh, it is important when there's a major watershed pulse. So this is a, an oblique view of the, the, the Golden Gate. So this is San Francisco uh, and Marin. And then so we're, I don't know how well you can see the bathymetry here, but it's really deep right here. And there's the Golden Gate Bridge. And so our, our charge was to measure sediment flux at this location is the product of discharge and concentration. So ideally, we're measuring what's happening in this little blob here. So another note is that it's tidal. So it changes everything. You have stuff going in on the flood side, stuff going out on the ebb side. And so we're trying to figure out what's the sort of the net or residual um, sediment flux that's happening. So our tool of choice was the acoustic Doppler current profiler, ADCP, which I would like to offer a rename to the, the sediment flux whisperer. <laughs> this, this thing is really cool. It uses acoustic energy to send, sends out acoustic energy into the water column. It's reflected off particles, including sediment in the water. And um, you attach it to your boat, and you drive along your cross section, and you're getting information about acoustic backscatter and, and depth and a, a, lot, a long space. And then from that, you can compute it can uh, water velocity, uh, and then if you know something about the distribution in space, you can get some discharge. And then if you can understand how the backscatter relates to sediment concentration, you can get uh, sediment concentration and ultimately sediment flux. So just a, we had a slightly bigger boat than the one I just showed you in the schematic, and we were aboard um, SF State's Burby Questuary, and it was a really awesome uh, vessel to work from. And you can see this is a really beautiful day. This is one of the days where you're like, wow, this is my job. So it was awesome. Uh, so, that, so that was what we were doing out there. And then just to kind of show you sort of how the, the data look, um, I told you that we wanted to be measuring right below the Golden Gate Bridge. It's very deep. There's a trade off in uh, the instrument sensitivity. So you can either have it be really sensitive to fine particles, or you can have it really far into the water column. So to, to compromise there was to, to move our, our, our track, our cross-section, to this slightly landward location where we were kind of following the 
slightly shallower specimen on shore, but it's still 75 meters, so it's pretty deep. And so this is an example of essentially the raw output from the ADCP, where you've got you're draw, or sort of drawing a map of the of the seafloor as we move from north to south over in San Francisco, and then you have this distribution of acoustic backscatter, which can be related to sediment concentration. So you can see this region here, uh, relatively low clear water, and then over here and downstream from Rexham Strait, relatively high water or high concentration. So this was sort of on the ebb side when stuff was leaving the bay. And so the uh, the pair, so you have acoustic backscatter, and you can also compute the water velocity. So this is now you know, acoustic backscatter on the bottom, and then looking at the velocity magnitude, um, you can see that you can get a pretty good resolution of, of of the cross section, uh, there's a, like a high region of velocity here, which is not doesn't have much to do with the acoustic backscatter. So the, the ADCP does a really good job of resolving this three dimensional velocity. And so we have acoustic backscatter. So our next step was to relate that to an sediment concentration, and we did that by collecting uh, water samples from the boat at a known depth, and then at the same depth we're getting that acoustic. Um, ADCP data and um, relate that. So this is a, a photo of, of our our sampling device. This is a smaller boat for this goal. And getting started in the day. This was a Dave and our former employee Kurt doing some water sampling in one of the most picturesque places on a very picturesque day. Uh, Dave also came out for the bad day. <laughs> This is a day that I almost lost my lunch a couple of times. Um, and uh, we got through and got some really great data. And uh, this is an example of a calibration curve of where you have that backscatter on the x-axis. And you're relating that to the bottle thing. Now we have all the ingredients that we need. We have our, our velocity distribution in space. At the cross section, we know our concentrations. And now we can transport. Velocity times area, concentration. And so I want to show you an example of a time series. This is a time series from our uh, 2017 data set. And so what we're, sh we're showing you here uh, on the, the right axis is tidal stage. So we started just before one high tide, went through the following low tide, and then back to the subsequent high tide. All work had that shift. That was the overnight shift. And um, the, the the two other lines there, one of them is for, for the discharge of water, it's the circles in the dark, and uh, the, the discharge of sediment is um, where. And so what you can see is that we started, uh, and then also um, there's also a zero line that I'm showing here. And in my reference frame, all the positive values are uh, the ebb tides, so this is stuff that's leaving the bay at the Golden Gate location. And the negative values are all the things that are coming into the bay on the subsequent flood tide. This is actually the, something had a little Mac translation error, but it's hours since zero since, uh, since midnight on uh, February 27th. So we started. Yeah, let's see, five. And so. Um, so another way to, so this is just one of our experiments that we did. So all, each one of those transects that I showed you becomes a dot uh, on, on the plot here. And so one way to try to summarize all the studies that we did in those three experiments and then also some work that has been done in the past is to, I'm gonna take these circles and squares and remove the time component and show a scatter plot. And that looks like this, so I've got Water flux on the x-axis, the discharge of water with the zero line. So we've got our ebb tide, flood tide, and then the associated sediment flux value. Again, so the all the ebb tides are up in this quadrant, and all the flood tides are down in this quadrant. And so some of the things that we observed was that in 2016, uh, the red data, there was really no difference, no substantial difference in our observations at the Golden Gate between the winter period, or the March storm, and the, the June dry season peak. So that was surprising. And then the other interesting thing that we found, um, well, 
was, uh, this is some, a summary of some of the scaling characteristics of the data set from showing the max discharge for each of the storms and the max um, sediment flux observed and then the max sediment concentration. One interesting thing was that basically regardless of the freshwater out inflow to the bay, the delta outflow component, um, the, the discharge really didn't change a lot. And so that really just highlights that at this cross section, the dominant flow is, is it's dominated by the tides. And so the little bit of fresh water that you're adding to the system is the blip compared to um, how big that cross section is. And then the other interesting thing that was kind of a common um, finding that we had was uh, so now I'm showing you kind of the bound our sediment flux values of plus 4,000 milligrams per second and minus 4,000, meaning positive 4,000 uh, ebb, negative 4,000 flood, is that you can see that uh, there were higher values of flood-directed sediment flux um, in actually in, in, all the, in all of our data sets, but I'm just highlighting it for this 2017 data. So that was surprising because we kind of thought, oh, well, stop leaving the, the bay. Uh, but you can see over here, on the, there's not that same high magnitude of the on the ebb side. So uh, to, to kind of further understand our, our data set, um, we have some water quality monitoring stations that have been supported by the RMP for a very long time. Um, and so we could look upstream and see kind of what was happening for these storms and what was sort of entering the system. And so we have some data from Alcatraz Island, Richmond Bridge, Tina's Bridge, and Benicia Bridge. And uh, we can look at things like flow. So this is the flow from uh, into the system coming in from the delta. We can look at things like salinity, and we can look at sediment concentration in this high, high resolution time series in space uh, for 2016 and 2017 time period. And unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you about all the cool things that are in there, but to summarize it, we found um, that the, there was a, a really a large freshwater plume um, that was well mixed in the vertical that the, ex the extent of which in 2016 was just downstream of Benicia Bridge. And in 2017, there was so much more water to the bar chart of the, the volume of flow coming from the delta uh, for these, these two storm events. Um, so you, and so what happened in 2017 is that this giant blob of fresh water and sediment pushed all the way out past the Cartinez Bridge. There's a very uh, big difference in the two, two years. And this made for some incredibly cool observations down. So this is where I said the extent of the freshwater plume was. And then if we look at our data from the Richmond Bridge, we have sensors at two positions in the water column near the bed and at mid-depth. And uh, we found super cool physics going on. This is a, a a time series of the salinity difference from what's what's the difference in the salinity from this location to this location? And so in 2016, there was not a whole lot of difference in the salinity between the mid depth and the bottom at Richmond Bridge. But in 2017, really strong vertical stratification and salinity. We had the gradients uh, of reaching 20, and so that induces this really strong density gradient, which makes for coolest physics ever. Uh, so this is now kind of walk you through. So we were fortuitously we had ADCC data from the Richmond Bridge. So we had we were out uh, on the boat collecting water sample here, and then at the time we so we collected ADCC data. So this is showing here is the velocity, the direction of the of the of the flow, and the magnitude of the flow at Richmond Bridge. The one day before we were sampling uh, in February 2000. So these colors are layers of water that are flowing in different directions. So at the surface, we had fresher water that's flowing towards the Golden Gate Bridge. And at the bed, we had salty water that was flowing into San Pablo Bay North. Um, and so this sets up this really cool classic physics where you have uh, ocean at the fresh or the salty water that's pushing up at the bed. And then uh, the, from the upstream, from the estuary, you have the, the lower uh, density water that's out at the so when you have these cool um, vertical gradients, you can get this uh, trapping mechanism. It's called the estuary and turbidity maximum. 
and it's a region along the estuary where you can get a localized maximum sediment concentration because you know the fresh water coming out and the salty water coming in and right at that version you know, get a lot of sediment that's trapped. So uh, our, we have ETMs in the bay. They're typically located in this region up here, uh, the Sume Bay region. And from the work that we've done, we think that we have uh, seen an ETM migrate in the 2017 data, migrate downstream into San Pablo Bay. And this is a, a mechanism to retain sediment during high watershed runoff events like this. So to summarize, um, the 2016 storm was not really large enough to export very much sediment that far downstream, so there was traffic in the 2017 was really uh, and it exported sediment further into the estuary, but then we had this really cool um, gravitational circulation set up by this density gradient that would be a mechanism to keep that sediment in the bay. <coughs> so the estuary is keeping its sediment generally. Um, and, and other things, the freshwater inflow is small compared to what's happening at the Golden Gate, but its effect can be large when it sets up these longitudinal density gradients. Uh, one thing that we noted was that uh, looking at our transects from the Golden Gate is that the water circulation that you might get from remote sensing for velocity and sediment don't necessarily reflect what's happening at this depth. So that would just be like a caveat um, that remote sensing is really important, but it would be very cool to make sure that you're a place like the Golden Gate where you've got a lot of variation in depth over the beginning. And then finally, because of logistical challenges that we face in data collection like this, uh, numerical modeling is important. So I want to say thanks to our cooperators and to um, the colleagues that made this work happen, and especially to Phil, I feel like he was a really good champion for this project and was rooting for us all the way. And so thank you. Please use a microphone because we do have some people participating online. I'm, I'm not going to try to string them together, but I'm fascinated by one of Maureen's slides, which was at the gate, and it showed about a, it showed a very unusual lag between maximum water surface level and, and maximum velocity. Mm -hmm. and, and we know by comparing tides and maximum velocities that there's a lag in the bay between you know, high tide and, and high velocity in either direction, which is a momentum phenomenon. But this seemed to be bigger than that. And I bet you have some ideas on what that's about. Um, there, there was a, a little bit of a, of a lag induced by the freshwater inflow, but it wasn't a lot. But really, the, that's, I think that's not a whole lot bigger than normal for this location. Um, but we have tide logs that I, I haven't poured over enough, but I, I do think that it's it was there was a lag induced. I think we, when we were out there, we noticed the flood tide seemed like it it turned a little slower, and the ebb lasted a little bit longer. Some of that would have been fresh water. Thanks, for Marine. Too. Um, maybe you said it, but and if you did, I missed it. What was the net sediment exchange at the Golden Gate over at Tide 7? In or out? It was in. For all, for for all, us, for, for all three? Yeah. For, for the, our, I mean, you can see we, we didn't have a lot of temporal resolution, but we did get one ebb to flood transition for each of those phases of for each of those experiments, and all of them were landward. And so, so how does that jive with the uh, Bruce Jaffe notion that the bay has become a net erosional system? Um, I think there is some complication to what we were doing is, if, uh, if you remember, I showed you know, when we were sampling relative to the watershed pulse. And so uh, we we waited about seven to 12 days after the, the delta alpha pulse hit to go out and sample. And so one way that we've we've considered to explain the what looks to be flood-directed water is that 
the watershed plume had already, if the centroid of it had already left the bay and was sitting outside the gate, then you would have this concentration gradient in. Um, but the, what we did know is that just the physics of what was happening in, in Pablo Bay still gave rise to this situation where it was a lot more trapping than we would have thought, than, than, than I would have thought previously. Sorry, I have one more question for Maureen also. Um, and I don't know if you have any answer for this yet, but uh, you brought up a really important and intriguing question uh, regarding remote sensing and estimates of sediment concentrations. Um, have you or will you be comparing uh, remote sensed <laughs> concentrations of suspended sediment and possibly even flux to what you get when you do a complete. Um, I think depth. that's a really great extension and further. Can I just add one more yeah. thing related to that is because there's a lot of work being done on um, contaminant bound to sediment. Mm -hmm. Tried to do this through remote sensing. sensing. So I think for this situation, if you do have remote sensing of the Golden Gate, you're going to see that surface layer flowing out. You don't know how deep it is, right? So, um, so I think that for contaminant bound sediment, yes, that um, you you could probably get like a, a reasonable understanding of the export for that surface layer because that's where the stuff is. But it, it would you wouldn't want to try to extrapolate that very far down into the. What about these guys? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this question is for Kevin. Kevin, did you say that in Southern California, it's two parts, did you say in Southern California they thought they had found different results mm. in their monitoring? We did, yeah. They had, had much higher concentrations of, of metals especially. And had they done the, the stormwater BMP as much? No, they, these were, um, in, in Southern California, they were pure wildfires that they were studying. So um, almost no homes, um, but they were higher intensity fires, which could be a factor, and the second year of sampling was an extremely wet year, so they had a lot of high flows, and the soils are very erosive in Southern California. Um, so those are probably some factors that Northern California is not going to operate under the same principles as Southern California, but it was just the, the closest data set that we had for high quality research, so we were trying to infer a lot of lessons learned from there, but I think it's likely that we're we're building up enough data here in Northern California to maybe get our own paradigm for how our systems are going to respond to wildfire. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, had a question for Kevin, uh, and that is you, you mentioned doing some sampling post wildfire for water column chemistry largely. Do you have thoughts about other factors from vegetation removal and so forth that might result in beneficial use impacts separate? I mean, obviously, there's toxicity testing that was done mm -hmm. originally. Yeah, I mean, um, so some folks um, in conversation have talked about um, benthic macroinvertebrate biomonitoring. That's known to be, there's known to be impacts. So kind of in one sense for ambient monitoring studies, don't go back out to areas where there are recent burns because you're going to get a false flow signal. Um, so that's something we didn't have a past data set for, so we didn't invest in that resource. But it's something <coughs> we could start to track and see if it's proving, showing a response trend. Um, the large woody debris is a factor uh, in these watersheds that we do a lot to encourage large wood in the streams where it's not going to cause a flooding problem and the fire is reset a little bit of that. And so that's something that the water board is working on to try to uh, allow um, semi burnt trees to stay in place and allow some of that large wood to remain in the watershed where it can be recruited. Thank you. I think there's a lot of questions about the um, in the flux uh, at the gate because this is the first time that I can remember in a while that some work has really been done and it's, it's been presented here. So, and I have another question about this because I do a lot with sediment being around in the bay. Um, and uh, but my question pertains to more on, uh, were there any surprises? And I mean, Dave, I've known Dave for a long time. I don't know whether he's here today or not, but uh, I don't think I've seen him. Uh, 
and I've been following his work as it pertains to how we work dredging projects on our navigation channels and where we move the sediment. So uh, I'm just curious, any further conclusions about or surprises from what has been known about the yeah. flux at, at the gate? And then particularly any thoughts, further thoughts about salinity uh, and what has been known in the past? Any conclusions, comments, further comments about that process? I think with the sediment flux, you know, we're, I've worked alongside Dave for seven years and uh, adopted a lot of his, you know, type of models of the bay and that kind of thing. And so it, I think what was surprising to us is that we just sort of thought that, oh, well, the sediment just, you know, comes in and goes out. And, you know, and so um, and some of that work was from the remote sensing stuff that Kathy Rule led with Dave in 2000. Um, but I think, and I, I do want to say we did build upon some work that Scott Wright and Lee Erickson and others had done. So there's been a little bit other work that was also performed at the gate. But uh, the main, I think it was surprising to us that it, the, the estuary does have all these trapping mechanisms that we hadn't considered before. And so 2016, we really just didn't see sediment at the gate. It, oh, it didn't really make it. And then 2017, there was more sediment in suspension till Bay, but there are these different mechanisms that were driving flow dynamics to bring it, keep it in. So that was, that was the, that's like the, the biggest surprise. And then, I have a comment leading to a question for Jing regarding the Green Planet work. And the comment just is, is to provide some perspective from what you said, Chief, particularly when you're looking at the, the cost data, the, you know, she carefully answered the question because we know there's a there's a lot of uncertainty in cost in like the, the, the costs tend to be really high due to limited information on the, on the cost associated with retrofitting of green infrastructure and cost of land we are optimistic that those costs would come down and certainly be much lower through optimistic you know opportunistic uh, uh, fighting and building of these systems but so correctly answered the question that these costs are relative at this point allows you to kind of see what would cost what type of structure versus other but to, I want to give you the context in Southern California they've done similar type of modeling for meeting various pollutant load reductions associated with uh, the stormwater permit requirements how growth of the PM downs down there the price tag totals 20 billion and that's at first a head turn but you've to put 20 billion into the context of a multi-decadal a plan of implementation to change to rebuild infrastructure it's not so bad when you think about the the area affected the number of people so what we're looking for here as an outgrowth of this this is the beginning of a dialogue that we're going to have is like what is the optimum uh, way, way about greening our gray structure uh, not just from not just be pcb centric P, i've also been saying pcbs are just sort of the ticket to into the party, but we really want to make sure we're, we're thinking about all the, the benefits and pros and cons associated with greening our gray, stru gray structure planning for climate change impacts, all the storm changes, sea level rise, and lots of current infrastructure challenges. My question to you, so with that background, is that I look, I'm thinking, we're thinking as well as using the percent of, of directly or virtually indirectly connected impervious surface drainage in any of our mm -hmm. Watches as a good surrogate for multiple issues, whether it be load management or related pollutant management. Your tool will allow us to do that in a, in a very broad or even specific context, how to cite various types of green infrastructure to optimize or the, the reduction in impervious surface, directly connected impervious surface, right? Uh, yes, I think the well of good thing about a swim is um, it has uh, separates the flow from a pervis to the impervis. So the, actually the tool we treat it, that's a technical detail, is we don't treat the whole water set. We only treat whatever comes from impervis. Yes. Other questions? Other comments? Uh, my question about what are, why are these uh, all topics all related? <laughs> uh, so for, I'll say my personal perspective is that they're all, parts of a dynamic, what's happening dynamically in the in the estuary, and they're all areas where we need to stay vigilant and keep um, focused on, I mean, wildfires, sediment supply, and both stormwater 
everything is very dynamic, and especially with regard to climate change and, and episodic uh, precipitation and, like I said, wildfires. So, um, and the last thought I'll leave you with is um, things are going to change even more dynamically because we are doing a lot more to open up the margins of our bay for wetlands. And um, so I think all of you need to stay plugged in and, uh, you know, help us out in the future. And um, I hope that most of you, I've been pretty plugged in. There's a grant from US EPA um, to the Estuary Partnership developing a wetlands uh, regional monitoring program. I uh, think about another year out, and um, I think everyone here, and Jen Sue is also involved in that. I think everyone should be thinking about that and plugging in a little bit as we talk about building our RMP. Is it, is it a one RMP or is it two separate uh, efforts? And um, hopefully uh, that's part of the dynamic nature of, of thinking things through as we move forward. So any, uh, anybody else? Okay, I think I'm holding you, I think I'm between you and lunch. So um, let's give our round of applause for all our speakers. They did a great job. Okay. Come back at 110, everybody, please. Thank you.